I'm Joe Killian, and uh, I'm going to moderate this panel. I'd like to thank all of you for coming on day two. I think uh, after last night, many are hungover, and, uh, you know, they, they thought the better of uh, the sponsorship panel. Uh, in all seriousness, though, we have got a, a group of panelists up here uh, that I'm proud to know, uh, proud to have worked with most of the people on the panel, and when I look at changes in the music industry with artists, with labels, with new media, uh, brands have been at the forefront of that and have been in a position, particularly in the last five to ten years, of changing and contributing, I think, to uh, the landscape. So uh, without that, I'm going to ask everyone to do a, 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 like a little introduction because you may not have had the opportunity to read their bios. So uh, I'm going to ask Liz Norris uh, from Activist to start us off and give us a, a little bit of her bio and then we'll go around the panel and then we'll start. Okay, hi, I'm Liz Norris. As you said, I'm with Activist Artist Management. Um, I was previously at a company called Roar for 11 or 12 years. We have recently sort of rebranded ourselves and as Activist, so that's a, it's a new company. Um, we have kept our our same music roster and a lot of our employees. So my day-to-day -day job didn't change, but for many of you who know me, my contact information did change. So I've been in, on the management side for my entire career. Um, prior to Activist, prior to War, I had my own management company. Um, and so I think for, for this panel, I can sort of speak to the artist side and the manager perspective. Um, of the clients that we represent, we represent the, the brand of the Grateful Dead. We, we manage Dead and Company, who we actually co-manage with Irving Azoff and Steve Moyer, because they manage John Mayer. Um, we manage Bob Weir, Michael Franti, uh, Naco Medicine for the People, um, Ben Rector, Dwight Yoakam. We also have some non-music clients that I think could be interesting on this panel. We work with Iron Chef Stephanie Izard, um, actor, comedian David Allen Greer, um, um, and so on. So that's that's me. Good, Molly Balin from Wasserman. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Um, I work at Wasserman. Uh, Wasserman is a full-service marketing agency where we partner with brands, talent, and properties. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work on the American Express business, um, helping them uh, negotiate and value and measure. Um, and manage their entertainment and ticketing partnerships. Also very fortunate to work with many people on this, on this stage as well. Um, prior to working at Wasserman, I was at MSG for a couple of years, and then before that I spent 10 years at Live Nation based in San Francisco. Um, and I feel really fortunate to have had that experience, to have the, the music, the, the vibe of, of San Francisco and the history there um, sort of in my blood as a fan, and then to be able to take that um, throughout the course of my career. I'm Jessica. Um, I'm with a company called Mac Presents, and we're a music sponsorship and brand experiential agency. Um, and we work on behalf of brands, but also on behalf of artists to put together partnerships. Um, we have a strategic partnership with Kara Lewis, so we do uh, brand partnership deals on behalf of her roster of clients, which include everyone from Chance the Rapper to Khalid. Um, and we really feel fortunate to work with a ton of different brands. We work with City. We also can work with Capital One. Um, we work with AT&T, we also work with Verizon, we work with both Uber and Lyft, so um, it's great to kind of sit in a, in a space where we can truly work with any artist and any brand um, to put together the best partnerships that benefit both sides. Hi, I'm Andrew Klein. Uh, I run the partnership group for AEG Presents, which is the music side of AEG. I oversee the festivals and sponsorships and partnerships for 33 music festivals, 40 music clubs, and about 20 music tours. And I am confused because I thought I was here to go bowling with Joe Killian. <laughs> That'll be a little bit later. Uh, I, I think, Andrew, uh, maybe we start with you because while the uh, title of the panel is sponsorship, we've all referenced the word partnership. And in the marketing and ad world, 
we come up with new words every couple of months, but partnership seems to be one that brands have embraced more than sponsorship. And I think uh, maybe, Andrew, in your role with one of the biggest promoters, first of all, if you would speak to that and then speak to a partnership that you have seen lately that you felt really worked. Could be one of yours at Coachella, could be another one. So I heard a funny comment about when a promoter said, oh, so you're my partner? He goes, so when I lose $10 million on this festival, we're partners, five million from you, five million from us, we're partners. So yeah, that's a bad joke, I guess, but we, we do. We, Does that we, mean we, we get our money back yeah. when that happens? <laughs> you know, you're, sharing, you're sharing the downside. But the, we, at AEG, we do call them partners, and they are partners because we sit with them and really want to understand uh, what drives their business, you know, whether it's with Amex when we know how we want to integrate technology into, uh, into payments. We, we sit down with it in a true partnership, and they understand our business, and we understand their business to make sure that we can, can deliver on the KPIs for an American Express type of relationship. So we do use them. Uh, it's a little more, I guess, negative connotation when you use the word sponsorship because you're saying, just write me a check, you're my sponsor. And I think the days of just getting a check uh, is behind us and we really do try to sit around a table or, and, and make it a collaborative effort. And so I think that's, we, we do look at them as partners as well. Um, and we're willing to get some money if we lose money on our festivals with them if they want anytime. Never seen it happen before. But in terms of like best projects, and uh, I don't want to yeah. steal Molly's thunder, but we did have a great, really groundbreaking program with American Express at Coachella, and I'm, I'm actually going to hand that off to Molly because she knows it more than I do, and it, was, it really was awesome program this year. Um, yeah, I'll caveat that by saying it was a massive team effort. Um, clearly, I was fortunate enough to work on the project, but a lot of other agencies and a lot of other people participated, and obviously the Amex music team played a huge role. But um, Amex's strategy is to deliver, is to deliver benefits. Um, we have a long history of doing that, and we really took that um, as we uh, thought about how we were gonna approach Coachella this year, thought about how to do it in a really meaningful way. Um, so uh, when we thought about it, we really wanted to be an essential companion for people going to Coachella. Um, and we did that across the entire journey. So from before the festival, we had an allocation of tickets. And you know, not every festival sells out. Coachella sells out. Having access to those tickets was critical and, and important. Once you get your ticket, the festival encourages you to register your wristband uh, through the app. Um, so you know, 125,000 people registering their wristband through the app. During that process, there was an American Express uh, screen where you can actually enroll your card using your Amex credentials. So once you enroll your card, there's a suite of, of benefits that we offered you. Um, so when you got on site, you had a free Ferris wheel um, for you and a friend. And again, anyone that has gone to Coachella knows that the, the Ferris wheel experience is, is a huge part of it. And we also offered uh, card members free embroidery, which is super in and hip right now. Um, there's also a priority line at the at, um, uh, Amex priority line at Uber at the end of the night. So card members had the opportunity to literally skip the line of thousands and thousands of people trying to get out of there, which was extremely useful. And then we also had a card member lounge on site um, in the GA area, which is something that uh, Golden Voice doesn't typically allow uh, brands to do. They, they want GA to be open to everybody. Um, but because of the relationship we have with AEG and, and Golden Voice, and um, you know, there's uh, a lot of trust and a lot of collaboration, um, they, they said yes, and it proved to be extremely successful. People want a comfortable place to go, they want a comfortable place to sit. Um, they were able to, card members were able to bring in three of their friends, so you know, it was open to more than just card members. Um, and the beauty of this whole program and the reason why it worked so well, I mean, of course, there were benefits that people wanted and things that people wanted to do and needed, um, but it was seamlessly integrated into the experience that Coachella uh, attendees were already doing, right? They're already registering their wristband, and in doing that, you enrolled your card. And then once you were on site, you were able to receive these benefits through the tap of your wristband. Um, I think that was really, you know, the, the sort of secret sauce in all of that. You, you know, that's a great example of a promoter with a property, so AEG with Coachella doing a partnership 
with a brand, in this case, American yeah. Express. Jessica, I'm gonna ask you, because you've been on the brand and the artist side, where it changes because uh, an artist has a personality, uh, has things that may or may not fit with their uh, persona and their uh, authentic self, shall we say? So maybe you could give us some examples of, of your work uh, with Khalid or others. Sure, and, and going back to the, the sponsor versus partner conversation, just to touch on that quickly, um, we were on a call recently reviewing a proposal with another agency that we're doing some work with for one of their clients, and their number one piece of feedback on the proposal, it had sponsor in the proposal twice, and they were like, just take the word out. I don't care what else you use, but if the word sponsor is in this proposal, it's gonna get rejected immediately. So we had to go through and, and rephrase certain deliverables to make them more partnership focused, and it was really just the use of the word. Um, but it was interesting to see how big of an adverse reaction people have to that word in certain instances. Others, not so much, but. I yeah. Had this. yeah. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, and the same thing. And yeah. coming from the brand side, it, yeah. it, it feels more like a shared. Yeah, and it's uh, really experience. about the mentality of sitting down at the table yeah. and coming up yeah. with the ideas and figuring out how to make it a win win. So I. I, don't, I wouldn't say that that word is taboo, but in certain conversations, they don't even want it as part of the conversation because they truly want to approach it as a, as a partnership and for that to be the focus. Um, and, and one of the artists that we've had the pleasure of working with that had a tremendous 2017 is Khalid. Um, he's one of Kara Lewis's artists and we've been working with him since the very beginning of his career. Um, and just as his album was getting to be released, in March of 2017, we did a deal with Forever 21. And at the time, Khalid had just signed you know, a, his first major record label deal um, and was relatively unheard of. He had kind of a massive underground following with his kind of core fan base via some of the singles that he had put out while he was still in high school. Um, but this was truly the first kind of four-way into the mainstream, and this deal with Forever 21 put him in 800 Forever 21 stores globally. Um, he was the face of two back-to-back -back campaigns for them, and we leveraged their email blast to 10 million um, customers. We leveraged their social channels. Um, we had Billboard in Times Square, so it really helped elevate his profile during that very important time um, setting up his album. And then from there, we were able to do deals with City. They did the pre-sale for his fall tour, and he performed on the Today Show. Um, he was in Uber's Grammy spot. They ran a 60-second spot during the Grammy telecast. Um, his album was nominated for five Grammys. So from the time that we did the Forever 21 partnership to, to Grammys was really only a matter of about nine months. And the fact that he was able to, to leverage his his profile in that way and to um, to grow his social base and to be able to um, really kind of speak to brands in the way that he is, is is incredible. There aren't a lot of artists out there that have risen that fast um, and done that many, many partnerships. And then he performed at the Nielsen Grammy party, which was, which was great. So, so in that case, you've got a young artist in a genre that embraces brands and you put together deals that really matched with the artist. Uh, Liz, I'm gonna ask you because uh, if some of the brands we've mentioned, whether it's Forever 21 or American Express or could be BMW, we understand that those are big corporate brands. What is unique in the music world is a brand like the Grateful Dead, who perhaps like the Stones initially, they were a band and had probably no intention or no knowledge of what a brand was, uh, but over a period of years, they built an aesthetic, they built a look, they built a feel, and they built a larger community that fit with those values and aesthetics. Uh, I would imagine sometimes, depending on the artist, for better or for worse, but uh, Liz, for you to work with a brand, The Grateful Dead, and then Dead & Co, and Bobby Weir, and all of that, very different than a Khalid uh, as a young artist, and maybe you could speak to what informs the Grateful Dead brand or Dead & Co when they look to exploit that brand, whether with uh, other brands or even on their own. Right, That's, it's a great question, and I think that that artist is, is the way we handled 
that is completely different than every other artist that we work with, and it's because the Grateful Dead is a brand, as we're all acutely aware. Um, they won, when Dead and Company formed in the fall of 2015, we did do a, a partnership with Amex, and it was a very interesting conversation because we had three of the original members of the Grateful Dead who had never done anything with a corporation, never done a sponsorship, and, and were very hesitant and skeptical of this of, you know, of, the, of even having that conversation. On the other side, we had John Mayer, who, you know, existed in a world where that was very common. So I think what we did and how what, how we found a way to to make that work for those particular individuals was to in, incorporate an element of charity. So we ended up um, donating proceeds from that event to the Robin Hood Foundation, um, and that's. I, one thing that I've seen more and more of with all of our artists is there is going to be an element of, of cause or charity or philanthropic efforts um, woven into any sponsorship deal that we do. Um, I think that's it's not only something that our company believes in, that we tend to surround ourselves with artists that also are very cause-driven. Um, so we do see that a lot, no matter... I think whenever you have the intersection of art and commerce, there's always going to be a, a complication um, or a challenge, not a complication, but a challenge, because those are two worlds that typically don't meet. But as we all know, it's it's part of the music business these days. I think, um, as you know, we're up here because this topic is sort of taken place, taken um, precedent in our industry as major labels have sort of stepped aside and as marketing machines. Um, we see we see sponsorships. We we, we come across sponsorships everywhere, um, and it's not only if an, our individual client is you know brings on a tour sponsor, or we have a festival and we have a festival sponsor. It's you know we've had a client you know be appear on a Today Show for example, and and that comes with who sponsors that stage. You know if you go play Jimmy Kimmel, there's a sponsor of that stage, and all of a sudden your artist is up there, and you know. Totally random example, but say, you know, Budweiser sponsors your client. You go to play this, this TV performance. That particular stage happens to be sponsored by a, you know, competing company. And it, you're not doing anything wrong, necessarily, contractually wrong, but it just feels so weird. It feels so bizarre. Um, and so we, we find that it's, even if we're not, you know, in an immediate situation where we know we're dealing with a sponsor, it's, it's around us all the time. Um, and I will say, as as management, what we have learned, um, probably by doing things incorrectly <laughs> and learning from our mistakes, when you when you do approach the merger of a of art and commerce, when you do find a, a, a brand or a product or anything that you're going to um, weave into the story of your of your your artist, it has to be very authentic. Um, if your artist doesn't believe in the company or the brand or the product, it's it's not authentic, and the fans will know. Um, one thing as managers that we we are aware of or acutely aware of is the the obligations of the artist once the deal is done. You know how many, especially when it comes to social media, like how many um, you know social media posts is that artist going to be obligated to incorporate that mentions brand or mentions the product and that's always very challenging because the fans know you know um, how many interviews the artist has to do and it's always a challenge to make that um, make sense in a strategic way um, we've had clients that typically don't do any interviews at all they're just not um, open to it and that's fine if that's their choice but all of a sudden they're in a, in a contract where they're obligated to do it so if you have a client that's not willing or not you know not interested in, in speaking to press that much, and all of a sudden, when they do talk to press, they're not talking about their music or their tour, or their album. They're talking about their sponsor. It's 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 you're set up to fail. So for us as managers, that's a huge challenge that we face, um, and we are very strategic to sort of make it make sense, figure out how to not subject our client to you know to sort of becoming a spokesperson. I think. <clears throat> yes, so the, the, there's a partnership, but you may not be a spokesperson. You may not be endorsing the product. You may be doing a deal for pre-sales or doing any some other type of deal. But I, I think Liz speaks to the details, which are critical. So 
if you look at a, a, an artist like the Rolling Stones, when you get into the contract with the Stones and you want a meet and greet at every tour stop, it will be very specific that there may be four of the uh, members there, there will never be less than two, and there may be either Mick or Keith. There may be both, there will be one of the two of them, and there may be another, so you could get Ron and Keith, Mick and Charlie, you could get all four. It depends on the uh, particular evening what other things they're doing. Uh, but the contract is that specific, and uh, it's really essential to have a contract that tells you from a brand side what you can do and what your limitations are. And I'd say most people up here spend a good part of their life translating that uh, to, between the artist and the brand. Because there's certain things a brand won't do that an artist would like them to do, uh, and you know, you go back and forth in that. Uh, Andrew, I'm gonna ask you, kind of shifting uh, the conversation here, the importance of technology in activations and partnerships now, particularly new media, social media, and uh, you know what you're seeing in that area uh, around your AEG partners. So we're seeing technology in a lot of ways. We have um, you know payment partners uh, like Apple Pay uh, and American Express who want to start tapping more into tapping your iPhone uh, to pay through Square. So I've learned there's like three different categories. You have Apple Pay, you've got Square, you have American Express, all circling the wagon of getting people to purchase. So that's definitely uh, tech integration. We're seeing, um, you know, we have this festival in New York called Panorama, and uh, we've positioned it as a music and tech festival, and Hewlett Packard has embraced it. They're our big partner. Uh, for that, where we've created a digital playground uh, showcasing HP's technology uh, and, and how young people uh, could use it because HP is thought of as a technolo technology brand that isn't necessarily hip and cool like Apple. Um, at every brand partner is uh, shooting short form content at, at, all, at all of our events that they could use to push out through their social channels. Um, everyone, because it's not just about the 100,000 people you're going to reach at an event. It's about the millions of people that you could take that content to and, and, and show it to the world. Um, I guess the technology, I guess Apple. But we're using augmented reality and VR uh, at, at, various, um, at various events. I actually am a bigger believer in AR than VR, because AR uh, exists in everybody's phone and everybody's, everybody's camera in their phone. So I think there's a lot of fun and new things that can be done through AR, and you don't have to put big, clunky goggles on uh, that make you look silly. So I think AR is uh, the next, one of the next frontiers in terms of uh, experiential marketing. I think that RFID, te RFID technology is there, but it's getting a little stale. I think we're doing a lot of push notification messaging into, into the apps now. Um, I don't know, these are, I'm a little all over the place, but these are the types of things that we're seeing and we're using uh, at our various events. You, you, you know, uh, Jessica, do you have any examples, whether you and, and Mac have done them or others, of uh, a real integrated approach to technology with an artist and a brand? Yeah, so actually, talking about the Rolling Stones, um, we did their deal with City for the 50 and counting tour. Um, and one of the parts of that program, so part of it was the pre-sale for the tour and all of that, and we did have meet and greets with all of the band members at every show. Um, but we also, City actually sponsored um, their app. They wanted to do a Rolling Stones app for the tour. And um, City came to the table in a big way and was the presenting sponsor of that app. And within the app, there was a lot of great content that fans could explore and discover. And then there was also a voting mechanism um, where people could vote for the song that they wanted to hear in the encore. And so City kind of brought that experience to life. And this was a few years ago. So, I mean, technology has even changed since 2013 when this was taking place. But, um, you know, the app was important to the Stones and they really wanted to do something innovative. And so City was the partner that was able to help them do that. And then fans were able to get engaged by requesting the song that they wanted to hear. And then Mick actually from stage would look 
at the screen to see what the song was that they were gonna do, and there was the Presented by City because they powered that experience. I mean, they basically helped underwrite the cost of, of developing that app and that technology. So, um, you know, and, and, and talking about being protective of the artist and, and what they're comfortable doing, I think what's most important in these conversations is to know the artist and to know, okay, this artist, it doesn't do interviews, but, you know, and they control their own Instagram, but they're, they're more willing to post about this type of partnership on Twitter. Is the brand okay with that? And we have conversations like that all the time. And, and when it comes to social specifically, you see those branded posts, but you also sometimes see, we just did a, a new fashion partnership with Khalid, actually, with Hollister. That will be rolling out. And a lot of the social that he's doing to promote the partnership is completely organic. It's not even that, you know, it, there's no branded backdrop. The brand isn't necessarily front and center in the post, but it's more of a lifestyle thing. And it's it's more of an authentic representation of who he is and, and what he's interested in and what he's doing with his friends. And, you know, and I think fans get that. Fans understand and they see the authenticity. And I feel like that's the most important aspect to a lot of these partnerships. Yeah, I think from a brand perspective, they're looking at properties, whether it's an artist or a festival or a venue, uh, to really help tell their story. And I think you need to collabor collaboratively tell a story. And that's really, I think, the, the um, when we talk about authenticity and we talk about partnerships that work, I mean, those are the ones that work, right? Um, um, when, when the artist is actually over-delivering on social because they love the program so much and they love the relationship so much. Um, and talking about technology, I think generally the, one of the beauties of technology is, um, is really deepening the relationship, I think, with, with the consumer, um, getting them to engage and getting them to participate. Um, everything happens through our phones these days. Anything that we can do via our phone is, is typically something we want to participate in. But what it's also doing is that it's also uh, mining data um, and, and it's telling brands and, and properties um, a lot about who's there and, and what they're doing. Um, and I think we're gonna get a, a lot more sophisticated with that data and how we actually use it um, more real time um, and more personalized. Um, so I think that's the exciting part when I think about technology. I'll tell you one other, th one other thing that I, I had a meeting on last week that I, everybody is saying everything needs to be in your phone, every communication, because everybody's got a phone. I had a meeting with, you know, at the airport clear where you put your fingerprints. They're doing some incredible things that um, they're going to, they, you, you, could, you could use clear to get into Yankee Stadium uh, and cut lines, but soon they're working on attaching a credit card to your fingerprint and attaching your age to your fingerprint. So talking about like your phone is not where you need to be reached, it's your fingerprint that you need to be reached. And I, and I was actually, I, I used clear this morning and it's incredible it coming, I took the red eye here, but imagine you could pay for your beer and they know you're 21 just from your fingerprint. I think that is really cool. And I think that's like the next generation beyond the app. Because now you, if you lose your phone, you still got your fingerprints. So it's pretty you cool. Your fingers. What? And you'll be bowling with your fingers later. <laughs> yes, I will. My understanding is Peter Shapiro has all of the balls, the bowling balls here. Uh, somehow he can capture your fingerprint on the data. <laughs> And it's in some massive database that somebody at Relics has got. <laughs> that uh, is Pete's data. Liz, uh, any thoughts that you have on technology with some of your, your artists, uh, whether John Mayer or others? Great question. And I, can't, I cannot speak to, to John Mayer, because um, we don't, quite like, do not manage John. We can manage with, with yep. Yeah. Um, um, that's a great question. I think. I think every, I, what you just touched upon is absolutely correct. I feel like um, uh, we're always looking to what's next, what's, um, what's going to be the next trend, the next, um, what's going to make things easier. Um, we have, our, our company is very unique. We have, uh, all of our managers sort of are specialists in, in, in something. Um, and we have a, a sponsorship person in our LA office who, um, is always thinking about about these things. Um, uh, I think obviously mobile is huge. Anything, as we just touched upon, anything you can do on your on your on your phone. If you can't, especially when it, I mean, if you go to a festival and, and that's all you have is your phone. It's not like you. 
have a computer or something with you. So I think, I think um, we're always looking for, we're always paying, our company's always paying attention to startups. Like what new, what new technology is gonna make it easier to buy merchandise from your seat without having to wait in line? What's gonna make it easier to, um, uh, I love that, yeah, I love the idea of the voting for the encore song. Um, so we're, we're always thinking about that. You know, I don't, I don't know what's next, but I think it's, it's, it's something that we're all acutely aware of at, at all times to figure out. I think too, it's interesting you see brands like Airbnb now uh, looking to do new things with experiences and concerts and the program they just rolled out with John Legend. And then you see Lyft partnering with Cardi B for her album release to, you know, for New York, you could have had her nail art be your icon in the Lyft app. And I think, as you mentioned, you know, the labels don't have the budgets that they used to have in terms of promotion. So I think these brands are stepping up in a big way with opportunities to help an artist promote or roll out their album, whether it's, you know, like a city or an Amex being able to leverage their direct to customer channels to promote a tour and potentially an album tied to the tour, or Lyft partnering with Cardi on, you know, this big moment for her album. I just I think you're gonna see more and more of that. Yeah, I think um, looking at brands as also a marketing partner, I think it's critical. And again, back to that word partnership, but brands um, um, can help extend um, to their hundreds of thousands or millions of consumers to help market your brand. Um, I think that's a, a critical part of how sponsorship and partnership ha has evolved. Yeah, I, I'd say whenever any of us talk to brand managers or CMOs, at the end of the day, what does a brand want? They want to be cool. Music is a way to be cool, but then it's the activation, whether it's an experience or technology that you create together, that you collaborate on, that makes it either cool or a total not cool thing. Um, I'm gonna ask Andrew, and we didn't discuss this, but I saw the other day BMW has a Coachella deal and I don't know what they did, but I did see that they had Portugal the Man, uh, uh, the, the, the lead singer who's also a visual artist, uh, paint two BMW cars, uh, which is kind of historic that BMW had done that m for many years, years ago. Uh, but it seemed like a reintroduction, and it was a, to me it was a fascinating thing that, that for BMW to do that. I'm still focused on Cardi B. That's all, sorry, <laughs> Cardi B. Um, so it's funny, uh, the, the B, BMW, Mercedes, and Porsche actually all wanted to be part of uh, Coachella. Um, they, they're changing like everybody. They don't want to reach the 50 and over, you know, wealthy person only. They want to think about the next generation. And they all, literally all three of them were, were with us probably 10 feet from where we were hanging out at Coachella, Joe. And they all want to be part of big pop, pop culture moments. Mercedes actually told me they did a deal with South by Southwest, but their idea was to take the brand South by Southwest and create a um, more of a creativity and architecture conference in Germany because the South by Southwest marks were uh, known in Germany. So th they wanted a partnership with South By, but they didn't actually want to do a traditional partnership or sponsorship at South By in Austin. They wanted to take the whole concept and bring it to Germany, and they did that. So with BMW at Coachella, you never saw one vehicle display on the field. It wasn't about uh, having people see the cars necessarily on the grass at this festival. It was definitely about creating content uh, this year they did it with um, uh, Portugal the Man. Last year they did it with Hans Zimmer. Um, and they just created, the, you know, it, it's the old cliche, the road to whatever, the road to Coachella. It's a little old already. But it, this year was a road to Coachella with um, Portugal the Man. And for them they wanted to reach uh, artists and influencers in the Coachella Valley. So they were picking up people all over the field. And, and really wanted to be part of pop culture. They wanted to get content with Portugal the Man. And that was what drove the deal. It wasn't like literally, it wasn't a vehicle display in the middle because there was not uh, a car there. Uh, Jessica, Andrew referenced the goal was influencers. And uh, I think we're all uh, familiar with social influencers, but 
Can you speak to the importance that influencers, many musicians, uh, and, and across design, across uh, literature, across food, uh, have become important to brands? I mean, I think influencers is, is one of the fastest growing areas of partnership um, within music and outside of music. Liz mentioned Stephanie um, Izzard. Uh, who is a wildly celebrated chef and is, is tapped often as an influencer for different types of brands and events. I think from an artist's perspective, um, certainly they are leveraged as influencers in different ways. And sometimes, as you said, it's not about an endorsement or it's not about being a spokesperson, but really it's about being on site at an event and saying that they were there for the launch of a new product, um, You know, walking the red carpet, posting photos of them, you know, enjoying the event, drinking a particular cocktail, um, in in the backseat of their Uber, going to so there are, are all different ways to do it. But I think ultimately, um, you know, the common theme is still authenticity and making sure that brands are leveraging people that can actually give them that connection to the fans that they're looking to connect with. And I think too, you touched on charity, which I think is so important these days. And I think there is a trend now within partnerships to have this charitable element. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of research and a lot of articles recently talking about how millennials, their purchase decisions are really driven by brands that have some sort of charitable tie-in or some kind of give back component. Um, and you see what, what even Chance the Rapper is doing with his charity, Social Works, um, and all of the partners that have kind of come to the table to back him. He has a deal in Chicago with Lyft where you can round up your ride to donate to social works um, and just you know working with a lot of different brands so brands are wanting to work with him because he has that authentic voice um, in that space so I think you're going to see more and more from influencers in music certainly but in culinary and fashion um, and across the board yeah um, I think from an influencer strategy perspective I think it's about really extending um, throughout the whole journey. Um, and I think it's about going beyond the, the Coachella or you know, beyond the show um, to really tell the story of what that brand was doing. Um, I think it's critical. And it just helps drive, obviously, PR ability and it's driving reach and, and impressions. And it's become a, 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 you know, a, a key part of, um, of plans, of activation plans. OK, well, we've got a few minutes left and, and then we'll, we're going to do questions uh, uh, from the audience. I'm curious, anyone on our esteemed panel, uh, uh, you know, we've all got a lot of experience, we've all spoken to some great activations or things that, that uh, we've seen or done. Any ones that you feel, uh, without naming names necessarily, things that you learned from that were, that went a little sideways from where you had hoped they'd go or, or uh, not necessarily failures, but uh, those experiences we all have had when we go out and we think something is very cool and it turns out that maybe it's just not or maybe we missed an element on it. Uh, anyone want to speak to that? I, I just think anytime it, it becomes an expensive secret, you know, you see brands pony up a lot of money sometimes to work with an artist, but if they haven't budgeted correctly to have the, the budget on the back end to actually bring the program to life and to promote it, you know, you'll hear about these promotions sometimes and like you can not you can Google it and you can't even find anything on it because there was no PR strategy. So I feel like oftentimes those are the ones that we look at and we're like, mm, that could have been executed better. Yeah, I mean, at Wasserman, you know, we talk a lot about the science of showing up and the art of being appreciated. And, and what that means is the science of showing up is all about data and all the consumer insights and demographic information and competitive landscape and all the things that tell you why you should be somewhere, why you should sponsor that particular event or that particular artist. Um, but the art of being appreciated is once you're there, knowing what to do. Um, I think that is essential. And I think that is what, you know, where strategic ideation comes in and creative thinking and you know, to develop the right experiential plan and, you know, without, you know, naming examples, we've, you know, Wasserman and, and many of the brands and partners that I've worked with, I mean, it doesn't always go as plans, but I think that if you can create a, a you know, have a strategy, how you approach things and, and be diligent about it, 
um, I think that you know you're, you set yourself up to win. I think without naming names, that's not a good idea, especially where <laughs> media is covering this. I think just what to stay away from is if you're a brand and you want to do a deal with an artist, make sure it's not a cash grab only. You know, a lot of these artists, yeah, I want your check. And you sign up for all these social media posts and all these appearances and all these, everything you need to do. And the artist just tells you to go F yourself. Thanks for the check. And it just, you have to, I, if I was, I'm, I've never been on the buy side. I've always been on the sell side. But if I'm on the buy side, I really want to sit with the artist if I can, or the manager at least, but not just the agent and the promoter. I, I, I really want to get as close and make sure that he's into it and he's not just taking the check for the check's sake. So I've been part of those deals before, but I won't name those, otherwise I have to kill you, Joe. Yeah, I, I actually just thought of one of my own. Uh, I was the executive producer uh, on the American Express on stage series where we paired a director with an artist during their first week of release. And I had done, uh, I had David Lynch directing uh, Duran Duran. And uh, if anybody has, I'm certain, seen David's films, you know he's going to do something very creative, very engaging, and it will be his own vision, and it will be completely unusual. Uh, and it was. Uh, and night, uh, as David had planned it, he had done a bunch of uh, uh, preset uh, video images that he played over the band. So when the band came on live, uh, if you were viewing the live stream, uh, you saw all kinds of images of Barbie dolls and hot dogs on a grill and all kinds of things. Uh, plus, he shot it in black and white. And uh, we had lots of comments from Duran Duran fans who are saying, get this crap off there. I want to see my band. And then we had a lot of comments online from David Lynch fans who said, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. Uh, flash forward, and you know, it was one of those shows, and we went on to more shows, and everybody was grateful for having done it. Flash forward a couple of years, and uh, MoMA called uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and they wanted to feature the show uh, as one of those unseen uh, masterpieces, which they did do, and it was a great evening and a great showing at MoMA. Uh, BBC has continued to uh, show it as a, as a great work, and I think sometimes when we do brand partnerships, we're not sure of the long tail and how it's going to be reviewed and received and where it's going to actually live in a couple of years. And that's the benefit of, I think, social media and new media, that work that may be ahead of its time can come to be accepted a few years later, and the brand still gets the attribution for having done that and done that cool thing a few years ago. So for a brand, that continues to live uh, on and on and on. Liz, were you going to say something? Did I... Oh, no. Cut you off? I thought that was very interesting what you were saying, um, <laughs> which, which sort of made me think. I think once it, 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 you're, you not only have the band's fans, but now you have David Lynch fans to, to, to keep happy. Exactly. Um, that's or, or not. Yeah, you know? that's uh, fascinating. Um, I think we've had one thing that we've... Um, dealt with, and, and it goes both ways. I think when, a, when an artist enters in a partnership with a brand, um, the worst case scenario is something bad happens to that brand. We, we, several years ago, we had an, a, a bank um, as a tour sponsor for one of our artists, and that bank was in the news soon after <laughs> and in a not so pleasant light, and, and th that was an awkward moment. And I, we change the story to the charity aspect of the partnership and but I think it also goes both ways like a brand can has to be has to have trust you have to have trust that if that brand is going to partner with an artist that artist isn't going to you know end up in, in public in, in trouble in some way um, so I think there I think our common theme is authenticity and also probably trust trust and authenticity on that note I agree uh, we'll take some uh, questions from the audience in, in the time we have left. So, uh, lights are up. Uh, does anyone... Yeah. A 
that's okay. Thank you guys, this is super informative, really appreciate it. Cardi B, uh, Cardi B. I'm wondering uh, what opportunities you think there are on a venue side versus the artist side for sponsorship, just beyond traditional like beer and alcohol sponsorships. I could take that, we own quite a few venues. Well, if, if anybody has any money to spend in venues, just please give it to Pete at Brooklyn Bowl. First, that's my first I second pitch. that. I second that. Um, as long as it's good for the bands, because I heard in the last speech it's got to be good for the bands, not just for the venue. It's hard. Doing deals in music venues are hard, because if you think about a, a festival or you think about a tour, there's an opportunity for a brand to communicate their message to the consumers. At, on a tour, there's the concourse. You have maybe an hour before the show to do something physical and interactive. And in a festival, you have 10 hours. In a club, the window for a brand to communicate with a consumer is very short. You, you want to come into the show. You want to get a beer. You probably want to get to the front row of the club. So other than the typical deal, the, the more traditional deals that go into de venues are beer deals, spirits deals, and energy drink deals. Those are maybe the top three categories. Then you have to be a little bit more creative uh, beyond that. And we have some deals with uh, Virgin, Virgin Mobile because they want to reach these young people in the music clubs. There's um, like Hint Water or Buy. They're spending some money to get distribution in the clubs. But I think the short answer is you have to be a lot more creative in terms of doing things physically. If you could set up a camera and do live webcasts or, or live content capture, then you know, the window gets a little bit more broad. But generally speaking, uh, I feel like the pool of brands doing stuff in smaller music clubs is just smaller. Uh, and you can't get a car here if you want to do a vehicle display and things like that. Yeah, I would say for venues, really, the best thing is look to create uh, private events with brands that your venue is a cool venue, and therefore they should throw an event or create an event there. Uh, I know I had started Central Park Summer Stage many, many years ago, and that's what drove, it, uh, drove our initial success were the private events that, that uh, brands could use that space. A unique space, obviously, but I think every venue has its attributes that you can sell to a brand. But I, I agree with Andrew. I think it's tough naming rights and things like that just uh, aren't of that much interest, but I, I would really look to private events because you've got a cool space and that the brand can own it for that evening or set of evenings. The official bowling ball of Brooklyn Bowl. Brooklyn Bowl. Yes. Here, it will be sold. It will be sold. Yes. Uh, other questions? Um, yes, uh, I'm Adam Paul with Seven Communications. So I was wondering what's the, um, the current uh, State of the Union on like large scale live made for TV, made for broadcast and live streaming event with partnerships? What was the full question? State of the Union yeah, on what, live what, streaming. How are you guys feeling about um, made for television broadcast, made for uh, internet broadcast and live streaming as a whole with partnerships? See, I was listening with the partnership side of things. So. I can take that. Um, I think, I mean, if you're talking about live streaming, I think you know, we, we had talked about this a little bit yesterday too. I mean, I think um, often brands are looking for more than just reach, and so you have to figure out how to engage. Um, the consumer and how to show that level of engagement um, when you're doing a, a live stream or any sort of broadcast. I think a, a logo in the lower third is just not enough for brands these days. Um, if you're talking about more broad scale network things, and that's typically outside of the sponsorship decision making and it usually lives in the media and, and advertising world. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's, it's hard from a brand perspective, I think, to figure out how to get in there and, and really accomplish your, your goals um, beyond just a logo. I agree, and on the, on the network side, um, you see things like you know, Billboard Music Awards are coming up. Um, we have had some success doing branded integrations in the show, but you really have to sit down and come up with that creative idea to figure out what that is and why. We did something with John Legend a couple of years ago where um, we actually did a private show for City Card members a couple weeks before the BBMAs and shot a commercial 
at that show. And then during the BBMAs, we were running the commercial and it went directly into John's performance. And that worked really well for what we were looking for as part of city sponsorship and activation of the BBMAs. But it's, it's, it's just a little bit more difficult. But I think that there is room to do some cool things as far as in-show integrations on the network side. We're, we're seeing uh, some pretty strong demand for webcasts at festivals. We uh, just webcast uh, Stagecoach on Yahoo, and we're going to do uh, Firefly on Yahoo also. And the numbers are really good, but the numbers are really good because Yahoo pumps the heck out of uh, TuneIn on their front page, on the front page. So you, you're gonna get a lot of people to, to view it. We just came off the most successful uh, broadcast, webcast of Coachella ever on, in YouTube history. Um, so that was really good, but Beyonce and Coachella make for a pretty good formula globally. Um, you know, so, but our, our goal is to actually beat those numbers next year. So we're already focusing on that for next year. So we're, and then there's that company, there's a company called LiveX Live that's going out and buying webcast rights for a, a number of festivals. So um, I, I think it's still, the, the business is still live and pumping, um, but we'll see uh, where it goes, I guess. You, what I'm seeing from a general brand perspective, uh, less is more. Uh, I know the Unstage series I spoke about, that was the, uh, you know, a 75 to 90 minute concert that was streamed. Okay, that, that went on for five, six years of shows. And then a year ago, we did Kendrick Lamar, Music Hall of Williamsburg, four cameras, four songs. Only, it was live, live, and then it was on demand for seven days, that was it. We had over 10 million views. Obviously, that was driven by Kendrick and the desire for Kendrick and the fact that he freestyled. Uh, but he was on Facebook Live, uh, so there's a, a lot of interest in that platform. And it's short, and it's, as we say, snackable content meaning uh, you can go on and you can watch two songs or three songs, and that may be just enough. From a brand perspective, you get many more views than you would in a 30-second commercial. You get it over and over, so there is value in that, but I suspect it's gonna be shorter. Uh, e even on the festival side, it's gonna be that Beyonce moment. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's really, really expensive to shoot, capture, and clear content on a large scale. Like, almost cost prohibitive, unless you're doing crazy, crazy numbers, and you have, you know, T-Mobile's been the sponsor of, of the YouTube broadcast for years, but uh, unless the cost of doing all this on a gigantic field becomes significantly less, it's gonna be hard, and what Joe's saying is if you're capturing something almost in a smaller studio or here on a stage like this, the content could be just as compelling, can get as many VOD hits, and the cost to produce it is probably you know, 90% less. So I, I think there's a happy medium between inexpensive, high quality uh, production on a, on a stage set and going out into a big field and shooting stuff, which is really, really expensive. Any other questions before they give us the hook? And uh, they're getting a mic to work, uh, so. Check, work. check, oh, there we go. Hey, Josh Barron from Olympa, thanks for your time. Uh, hi, Josh Barron. Hi. Uh, as Molly mentioned, we live in a, uh, an increasingly sophisticated age of, of data, and I'm wondering um, if you guys can give us a sense of a benchmark of the types of data that you're either looking to receive as a client or you're looking to deliver as a client to those brands. Benchmark data points. Anyone want to take that? I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, I, I think every brand has a set of KPIs that they look at to determine um, whether or not a program was successful. Mo Mo Molly, define KPIs for everybody. <laughs> it's a, it, KPIs is how you measure your, your program. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's, you know, the brands that I've worked with, I think, um, you know, a big part of it is, is engagement and how we define engagement, whether it's a ticket engagement or an activation engagement obviously is different. Um, we're also looking at you know, PR and, and uh, PR reach. Um, and we're looking, of course, 
talking about the financial category, we're looking at spend um, and share is a really big question that we that we think about because that helps us determine the opportunity um, and sort of you know how we would approach that property. Um, so it really varies, I think, based on the brand and then based on the, the property that we're talking to, whether you're a ticketing company versus a festival property. Yeah, and, and with that, I think brands are looking for data on the artist side, too, as they're trying to make a decision on maybe what artist is the best fit, best fit for the program based on their KPIs. And so um, we look a lot at social numbers, both reach and then also engagement. And we've had a few briefs recently that have come in where there's like a benchmark, like um, we want to work with an artist that has a minimum of 500,000, you know, followers on X platform. And so they may send that benchmark and then attach a budget to it. And we may go back and say, okay, totally get that this is what you're looking for in terms of reach, but then you need to increase your budget because this is, this is off. So, um, you know, brands more and more are looking at and putting a high value on those, the social reach. And I think on the artist side, it's figuring out how you monetize that, but, but do it in an authentic way that feels good for the artist. Uh, I, the, the other side of the coin, and uh, Jessica, you may be able to speak to this. Many artists, when they uh, are approached to do a sync deal for their music in a spot, uh, they want to know, okay, how much weight are you going to put behind it? Because television commercials have become a place to break a song, uh, particularly music that may not get played uh, on radio. And it's if the brand is only going to put a million or two million behind it, that's significantly less than a brand who comes in and says, I'm going to put $20 million of commercials up there. I'm buying uh, the NBA All-Star Game or the World Series or the Super Bowl or something like that makes a big, big difference on the artist side. And the artist is actually more and more, the mega artists are demanding that of brands. Yeah, definitely. But I think too, it's evaluating the, you talked a little bit about culture and, and being a part of culture. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about that before the panel. And in the instance of Khalid with the Uber commercial, for example, you know, Khalid was nominated for five Grammys. Uber wanted to feature Khalid in their Grammy campaign, The Road to the Grammys. Um, they were willing to do billboards, or they did billboards in New York and LA to support it. And for Khalid to really be a part of that moment at the Grammys, to be not only be nominated, but be performing, and then also have the 60 second spot run. And then, you know, for Uber to show up in that way for Music's Biggest Night, I mean, it was, it was definitely a win-win and something that Khalid was very proud to be a part of. Great. Uh, I don't know if we're out of time. I mean, the clock up here says zero. Do we? One last one. one. One last question, okay. You're not done yet, Joe. Uh, no, then we're um, all we're Actually, all here. we could keep going. It's pretty cool. It's an hour in, and you know, well, everyone you know. here probably would agree. We could uh, keep watching you guys, or hearing you guys. It's, it's interesting to hear it like this. And uh, I'd be curious to hear each of your, starting with you, Joe, what's, your, what's the best um, collaboration, partnership, thing, sponsorship, whatever you want to call it, that you've ever been a part of, each of you? Uh, okay, the best uh, I can say from a brand perspective, uh, my, my client Amex, uh, we, on her 1989 album uh, from a few years ago, uh, she had selected Joseph Kahn to direct her Blank Space video. Uh, we produced it, uh, both the video and the app that went along with it. Uh, if you didn't see it, the, the uh, video takes place outside of a, a chateau. We shot the inside of the chateau in 360 with Taylor. Uh, Taylor went through the home. We added new characters into the storyline. We added 40 collectibles, which if you found them, uh, things like there was a grandfather clock with 13 numbers on it. 13 is her lucky number. You clicked on these collectibles, and if you found 10 of them inside of the Blank Space song, uh, you, you opened a, a private video that she had given us. Uh, huge success, hadn't been done before, uh, very engaging. American Express, uh, because Taylor had a deal with Good Morning America, uh, we were featured on Good Morning America. She went on, she talked about it, she 
uh, had the app on an iPad. She played with it. Uh, she, as an artist, was very, very engaged with it. Uh, it went on uh, to win a digital Emmy for Taylor, for American Express, for myself. Uh, and it was one of those things where the brand and the artist really wanted to do something exceptional together. Uh, and and they, they both collaborated on it. And it was a true partnership where uh, the brand funded it, uh, but the attribution, if you download the app now, the attribution to American Express is still there. Uh, Taylor still looks at it as a high point uh, of doing something in technology that was very unique. Uh, and, you know, she's on her way to an Emmy and a Tony and an Oscar and whatever else she's going to win in her career. So for me, that was probably uh, next to selling, uh, 30 years ago, next to selling uh, uh, Miller Beer on uh, sponsoring Summer Stage. I think that was uh, 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 the best one. And I only say Miller because it was a lifeline. Summer Stage would have been dead after two years if Miller hadn't stepped in and uh, we poured cold beer on hot summer days. That's hard to follow. I don't, I honestly don't think, like, I don't have one specific instance that comes to mind, but I will say it's, um, the success stories are when the variables, variables that you cannot control a line. It's when you get that Grammy nomination, when nine months before you entered a partnership and you were submitting to the Grammys, you didn't know what would happen, and then you get the Grammy nomination, then you get the TV spot. It's, it's when those, those things that you can't control, when you get lucky, um, it's when at the end of the day your, your artist is still happy, their brand is still intact, um, the partner is still happy. It's, it's, and you move the needle. I think at the end of the day, both sides want to move the needle um, when, you see re when you see positive results and, and your client's still happy. I think that's the, that's the key to success. So I think we talked in depth about the, the, uh, the activation that I think probably most proud of to be a part of the team was the Coachella um, Amex activation. But um, one of the activations that I saw recently that, or last year, that I thought was, was incredible. And what was incredible about it was the ability for, the, for this brand to be able to pivot. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. Not um, enough. You can get more. You yeah. can get more from Andrew. That's, that's, that's pocket change. That's what they say. Um, <laughs> um, but of, you know, all of us know, we, you know, our beloved Tom Petty passed away last year. And um, at ACL last year, right before Jay-Z went on stage, they had Tom Petty's uh, performance, ACL performance from a uh, previous year or a year before that. And um, it, they had him singing Free Falling. And at that moment, out came um, Skydivers, sponsored by Red Bull, in the middle of the crowd. And it was just an epic moment and the ability for a brand to be able to pivot and be nimble and pull something like that off, I thought was, it was, it was incredible. That's awesome. Um, I'll reach into the vault a little bit, and um, one of the programs that I think was was one of the most special, I think, in, in my last 11 years doing this is, um, in 2011, Foo Fighters came to us, and they had just recorded their album, Wasting Light, in Dave Grohl's garage. And Dave had decided that he wanted to play in fans' garages as a way to roll out the album. And so we needed to raise the money to basically pull off an eight city tour taking Foo Fighters to perform in eight fans' garages in, in eight markets. Um, and we made one phone call to Blackberry, um, who was a big client of ours at the time. And they were launching the Playbook, which was their iPad type device that um, kind of launched and then didn't really take off. But um, it was an important moment for them. And so they decided to sponsor the Foo Fighters Garage Tour. Um, and we basically launched a campaign where fans were able to upload why they deserved to have Foo Fighters come to their house and play in their garage. And certainly they had to include a photo of their garage and the dimensions of their garage and some qualifying factors. But we were able to go in and pick winners in eight markets and then actually bring the band to these eight homes to do these concerts for a super fan and their 50 friends. And the first event was in New York, it was in Yonkers, and it was a retired 9-11 um, uh, firefighter. And it was all him, it was him and all of his buddies that were there. And to be there and to witness this moment that we created by bringing the band to this 
house in Yonkers to play this very special performance in the garage. There was like meat curate, curing in the garage. And like, it, I mean, the guy was wearing like a queen jean jacket and like, it was just, I mean, we went into his home, into his space and, and brought this moment that was so moving and unforgettable for that fan and, and those friends that got to show up. And Blackberry got to have the content from that that they were able to push out. But being there was just, you know, it was so special. And I feel like those are the moments, too, that you can create with brands sometimes that, that they become just unforgettable, very pivotal moments in, in people's lives. And I think that's one of the most rewarding aspects of what we do. And uh, the deal that uh, I'm most proud of, um, uh, it goes back to Coachella, it's a big event. Uh, I realized, everybody realized, it's like this, it's the biggest fashion event in the world. It's, big, it's a bigger fashion event than it is music event in some cases. And I had the idea of doing a, a licensed line of clothing uh, inspired by Coachella. And I met with Paul Tillet once, then I met with him again twice, and by the 10th time, uh, he allowed me to go and try to do this deal, and we spoke to H&M, and we launched the H&M Coachella collection, uh, and we did it for three years, and we sold $150 million worth of clothes in three years, and mind you, those clothes are, you know, like $10, a t-shirt at H&M, and it was really uh, gratifying to see in Times Square the H&M store, uh, there was a video playing in Times Square that was all themed about Coachella and H&M, and every window around the world in every H&M store globally had a themed H&M Coachella display, and there was a whole uh, section. So for me, it was just cool. I, uh, I, I had the concept, and I was able to deliver this global clothing line, and I've never done that anything like that before in my life. So that was very gratifying, and, I, and it was a win-win because they made a lot of money, H&M, we did fine, and it happened for three years, so. Good stuff. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I want to thank all of the panel. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Andrew, Andrew will be, uh, uh, with myself, will be bowling shortly if anyone wants to join us. You can see my gutter balls, but sincerely thank you, and thank you all the panelists.